Yeah, I'm watching that. All right, let's go. Good evening and welcome everybody to a new edition of the Bitcoin Evening Brief because this week was a crazy week, not only in the markets, but also for Jimmy Song and Tone Bass. Jimmy was in Charlotte doing a seminar and Tone was cruising around in the Southeast Asian Sea. In Singapore, he did his best to keep you updated with the price. Tone, why don't you tell us a little bit about the cruise? Sure. Uh, so the cruise was actually a lot of fun. Uh, one of the things is I, I've been on a cruise a long time ago, and I always thought that internet on a cruise was impossible. There actually was decent internet on a cruise. Maybe not decent inter internet enough for our followers when I attempted to stream stuff from it, but it was definitely decent enough to get uh, some work done. Of course, I didn't do any work because I was on a block, I was on a cruise, uh, but um, this opens up, you know, a whole new you know, possibilities to those that people that want to work and want to cruise while getting some work done. I thought that the internet was pretty decent and pretty affordable. Um, I didn't know that there was a uh, right somebody on there that was covering the cruise for Bloomberg, uh, and they did write an article that was published uh, in Bloomberg Technology section. <laughs> uh, Blake Schmidt, any relation? <laughs> 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 no, I, I decline responsibility for that one. <laughs> and um, that actually is the cruise ship we were on. It was um, it was a royal one of the Royal Caribbean uh, cruise ships, and this was the day when the cruise ship went over to Phuket Island, uh, and then we had to take like these boats uh, uh, off of the cruise ship to take us into uh, a private island uh, where. Uh, I mean, I was speaking on this stage as well. Uh, it's interesting, like the, the, I guess the writer of the article had no idea who I was, uh, which is fine. I'm not a big name uh, like uh, John McAfee or McAfee. I still have, I thought I knew how to pronounce his name, but now I'm confused once again. Um, and also uh, Ronnie Mose. Now, they were the two like high profile speakers at this event. I personally think both of those guys are totally clueless uh, when it comes to blockchain and crypto uh, and all this stuff. So I found it a bit unfortunate uh, that those were the two highlighted speakers because um, I am not a fan of either one of their works. Uh, in fact, one of them has been blocked on Twitter. Uh, I mean, you, you kind of know about people that have you blocked on Twitter, right? Um, I only block straight up, you know, a trolls or like malicious accounts on Twitter, and I only block like three of those. So um, th th that was the slight unfortunate thing. I am quasi mentioned in the article right here uh, in this a sentence or in this paragraph, I should say, where it says, "On Wednesday, McAfee blamed the recent market slump on the unfounded fear of government intervention." He urged cryptocurrency holders, one of whom sported a buy the dip t-shirt uh, to stick with their bets. So that's funny how uh, the buy the dip t-shirt guy, that was actually me. And a lot of people figured that out by reading the article and they messaged me about it. They're like, hey, tell them, was that you? Uh, yes, uh, that actually was. Uh, this is the buy the dip style t-shirt. Uh, it's really, really cool. It's one of my favorite shirts. I wear it these days. It's starting to take over. Uh, the, as the main T-shirt that I wear over the Don't Trust Verify T-shirt from Blockstream, which actually takes us right into the next story, which I find very, very unfortunate. Um, why don't you tell us whether well, you're going to tell us whether you bought the dip later, right, Ton? <laughs> um, well, I kind of always buy the dip because uh, I actually don't have. Uh, uh, let me rephrase that. I never buy the dip because I don't have any cash to buy the dip. I have completely moved my life over to Bitcoin, which is why I can't wait for lightning nodes so that my life isn't costing me all these giant transaction fees. Uh, since people are clearly too lazy uh, to implement SegWit, uh, my, my number one thing on the to-do list when I get back home to New York at the end of February is figure out how to make a lightning node. And I know they say that if you're going to use lightning on mainnet, you should only do it in very small amounts. I'm gonna 
I, I'm just going to go all out. You know, I'm going to accept any payment, whether it's 0.1 Bitcoin or whatever, uh, no matter how significant it is, I will be taking my chances and I'm going to create a lightning node for my trading seminars. And you know what? If it costs me a month of income because something goes technologically wrong, so I'll eat it. Okay. And then, I, then I'll stop and I'll wait till the technology is better. But I am going to. I'm, I'm not just going to, you know, use Lightning for microtransactions. I'm going to use it for real transactions because I really want to progress this technology. So Tone is all in on Bitcoin and Lightning, if you didn't already know it. Uh, actually, since we're talking about Lightning, maybe you can pull up that story. <laughs> all right, let's, let's talk about Lightning. Uh, maybe Jimmy can give us a little more details. So this is from January 19th. I'm assuming this is just, I guess, two days ago. And I'm assuming the research for this wait, article wait, was it, today. Done. Today is the 19th tone. Oh, today is the 19th. Oh, <laughs> I'm in Asia. <laughs> oh, yeah. It might be the 20th <laughs> for you. Yeah. Maybe I'm two days ahead. Oh, no. Wow. It is only the 19th. OK. Yeah. Um, oh, no. My, my clock is on New York time. It's so weird. Like, anyway, like when we're out in sea, like your phone keeps picking up these GPS signals from God knows where. So like what you look at your clock and it's like one time. Then you look at your clock half an hour later and like four hours have gone by because your clock picked up a different GPS uh, signal. It was just like that. No, it was impossible to, tame, to tell what time it was out there, uh, which is kind of important because when you get off the cruise and you don't know what time it is, you're going to miss it and you're going to get stuck on some island. Uh, but uh, so this are, the research for this article was probably done a while ago because Jimmy is pretty sure that this 29 nodes is clearly outdated. Yeah, no, th this was written earlier today, but um, but I, I think the writer wrote it like last night or something uh, because there, there's a lot more than 29. I think it's approaching 100. It might be a little bit bigger. I saw a tweet from somebody I can't remember, but they were showing like the increase in lightning nodes on the main net network. Um, but yeah, I mean, going back to Blockstream, you guys didn't give me a chance to talk about Greg well, no, no, Maxwell. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about, let's talk about <laughs> Lightning first. Let's talk about Lightning first, then we'll talk about Blockstream. All right. All right. Well, I, I'm, I'm excited about it. Um, I, I, I kind of disagree with Tone in the sense that you should probably not put too much money on it because you, you <clears throat> the way Lightning works is that your private key has to be online. And that private key is utilized to uh, sign transactions back and forth. And... I, I don't know if we know the uh, security properties of doing that just yet. Um, we don't have HSMs, and you need to sort of auto sign all of these, like as you as you um, work on like getting paid or paying somebody. Um, either way, you have to sign something. So you you should be a little well, more well, careful. We'll, 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 te we'll, 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 we'll test those uh, security features <laughs> once, I, once I get some, some, some real... Uh, well, I mean, so, somebody might go. come up... So that, that increases your attack surface considerably because um, if it's online, then somebody can hack into your computer while you're online and just get your private key and then like pay themselves everything or like give the other person all of your money or something like that. There, you have to be careful. There, there, there's a reason why you know people are or the devs are asking you to do it a certain way, and you should listen to them, uh, or you might lose your money. So I, I mean, just, just word to the wise. You know, be careful, especially if you don't know what's going on. And you know, I, I, I plan to you know put like twenty to fifty dollars on a lightning channel and see see what I can buy with it. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't put like ten thousand dollars on there. Uh, in the chat, some people said it's uh, 61 nodes mm -hmm. and uh, 107 channels. Mm -hmm. and one guy said three confirmed. But yeah, please be aware of the security risks. Let Tone be your guinea pig. <laughs> put Bitcoin on it and see whether it survives for the rest of the year. Don't do that at home, okay? No, no, I don't, I don't know. T -t Tone doesn't have 10 Bitcoin. Tone's broke. Uh, in case anyone is watching in the yeah. next country I'm about to fly into. Yeah, no, Tone has no Bitcoin. Tone, that's why he's opening a Lightning channel. Um, although, I, at least uh, game theoretically, you need to have a little bit in there, uh, even if you're receiving, so that you're not motivated to sort of cheat. Um, at least that's how Lightning works. So uh, we'll see. We'll see. 
So, uh, Jimmy, you were excited about the uh, uh, Blockstream story, even mm -hmm. though you're a bit sad, sad excited, right? Well, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm I, I don't know if I agree with Tone that this is bad news. This is great news. I mean, uh, he's he's doing it so he can focus on Bitcoin, right? You you look at the news, um, and it says uh, it says, you know, uh, he, he's he wants to work more on the protocol, on the cryptographic privacy and security technology, um, and you know, I, I I get it. He he's a he was CTO at at um, at Blockstream. And that may that means uh you know if you're CTO you have to manage a lot of projects that maybe you're not that interested in and I want Greg Maxwell to work on stuff he's interested in and not on stuff that maybe he's not so interested in and um and you know uh, we all know he's a great developer he 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 code reviews more than anybody he's uh he's very good at finding flaws in certain things um and I I want him to be full time Bitcoin instead of full time Blockstream I I mean. They're aligned in many ways, but um, you know, by I, I think this move, is, at least for me, is him sort of stepping out of the shadow of Blockstream, even though he co-founded it, and sort of uh, giving himself more into Bitcoin so that he can make Bitcoin better. And I think as holders, this is kind of what you want because his incentives are aligned with yours and not necessarily Blockstream or their investors. I mean that said, I mean Blockstream's doing great things. You know they have Lightning Charge and things like that that came out over the past week that uh, I think I think we should all be excited about. Uh, but you know I mean who know who knows um, you know what that company does. I mean just because they're good now doesn't mean that they'll be good forever. Um, and you know we we've seen that with other companies in this space. So I I see this as a good move. Um, I want Greg to be working on what Greg's interested in. And I don't want him to work on something that he's not as interested in or stuff that he doesn't think it will help Bitcoin quite as much. Uh, so I, I see this as a good move. Uh, congrats, Greg. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm excited for your, the next step of your journey. And I, I really hope that you continue to contribute to Bitcoin um, even more than you already have. So, so this is about Gregory Maxwell uh, leaving the co-founder of Blockstream. Tone, you thought this was bad news. Yeah, I mean, I was a big supporter of Blockstream. Now, I know Blockstream gets a lot of shit because, uh, and it's so interesting being in the space, right? And um, you realize how crazy and dumb conspiracy theorists are, right? Like, I, I think there was a point in my life, like probably in like early 2010s, something like that, um, when I'm buying into this whole notion of conspiracy theories about gold and about the Federal Reserve and all this nonsense. And um, like at the time, I thought, oh, this makes total sense. And then you end up on the Bitcoin side of things and you understand exactly what Blockstream is. You understand exactly what they do. And I know there is no conspiracy theory there. Starts making up shit for their own agenda that Blockstream controls Bitcoin and these developers are programming for the Bilderberg group. And now what are they, with Maxwell leaving, what do they have, like two uh, core developers left? Peter Will, and I'm not even sure if Luke Dash Jr. counts. I'm not, I don't even know if he ever he, really he, was, he was a contractor for Blockstream. I don't think he is currently a contractor as far as I know. Right, because he totally went against all of the Blockstream developers when he was the main supporter of the user activated soft fork. And I was on Luke's side on this one against Blockstream as a view and for the user activated soft fork with Luke. Now, now Luke is, you know, trying to get a lower the block size. So I'm obviously not on Luke's side on this one. Uh, but so who's left at Blockstream besides what? Andrew Polstra and uh, uh, Peter Willa. Oh, lot, lots of people. Mark Friedenbach, no, uh, Christopher I'm... Allen, um, you know, a no, bunch no, no, of no. other I mean, devs. Like, yeah, but it's Christopher. Well, wait, didn't Christopher Allen, wasn't that the former CEO that's no longer with them? No, no, that's a different guy. Christopher Allen's a developer. Um, Christopher Allen's a developer. Yeah. Who am I thinking of then? Uh, you're thinking of someone uh, else. I, I, I know, I okay. know who you're talking about, but it's not Christopher Allen. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, Chenko Labs, I think, has more developers now. They've always than, had. Um, they've always had more. Developers. <laughs> People don't realize they have like seven developers at, at right. Chenko that, that contribute to Core. Yeah. 
Right, like, like this is so crazy, like uh, thinking that Core um, controls Bitcoin in any way. Um, so, I mean, in a, in a way, this should, you know, uh, get all of those conspiracy theorists to shut the hell up uh, about and leave Greg Maxwell alone. Greg Maxwell, I guess, as well. Uh, I would have liked to see, you know, blockchain continue doing what they're doing. But hey, this just means Bitcoin is even more decentralized. And that's a good thing. You're right, Jimmy. After all, all good news, we come to another good news that Jimmy needs to explain to us. <laughs> and that's the cryptology ePrint archive report. Simple Schnorr multi-signatures with application to Bitcoin. So, Jimmy, why is this good? Okay, so uh, if you if you studied Bitcoin at any length, you know, well, I mean, even practically, if you do like a pay to script hash, um, uh, if you spend from like a multi-sig, right? Like if you have like three of five or something like that, um, the costs tend to be a lot more. And the reason is because each each of the three of five signers has to put in their own signature, and that that makes it pretty makes the transaction pretty large. And this is why, like uh, when you when you have transactions coming out of Bitco, they they're they're pretty big because uh, you know they're at least two of three. And each of those, each signature is pretty large. Um, they're on average something like 72, 73 bytes per signature. They're the biggest part of any transaction is, is the signatures. Um, what Schnorr, uh, the promise of Schnorr was always that uh, you can aggregate uh, signatures into a single thing. And this is a paper that sort of gives very practical, uh, gives a practical way to do that. So you could have like seven of 13 and it would no, it would you don't need seven separate signatures. You more or less have, at least according to this uh, uh, the synopsis here, you 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 only need like a thirty-two byte thing instead of like seven uh, seventy-four byte uh, signatures, right? So you're going from like five hundred bytes to like thirty-two bytes for something multi-sig. So you don't have this penalty for doing multi-sig and. From a security perspective, multi-sig is way better than a uh, single sig because uh, you know you can lose a private key and you're still okay, right? Like you can still move stuff around, and uh, you don't have a single point of failure. From a uh, and it, it, that's a that's a really good thing. And, and as Bitcoin gets uh, higher in value, you have to think about these things and how how you're going to uh, you know make sure that you're you're preserving your money. This sort of takes out the um, the uh, um, what what you would call uh, the penalty for um, spending from multi-sig or P2SH uh, things. And MAST helps in that way too, because you can have like these very complicated rules, um, not Turing complete, of course, but complicated rules and, uh, that you don't get to see unless you're, you're in a certain uh, branch of it. But basically, this is going to make multi-sig a lot less expensive. And we want people to be using more multi-sig to store their value. And, um, and you know, that, that's an important aspect of it. Now, wh whether there will be applications coming out on top of it, um, that's, that's probably a little bit farther away because you need Schnorr signatures in order to do this multi-signature scheme. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really interesting paper. Greg Maxwell, Andy Polstra, Peter Woolley, uh, Yannick Surin, I, I don't know who that is, but uh, uh, thank you all for uh, working on this paper. Very excited to uh, figure out how, how, that, how that all works. And at some point, I look forward to uh, coding it and, and, uh, and trying it out and making uh, you know, some sort of wallet that, that utilizes all of this stuff. So the bottom line is if your last name is Schnorr and you can sign your private key with that name, you own all the Bitcoin. <laughs> if only that were true, yeah. No, it's, it's, it, technologically, this is absolutely brilliant stuff. And it, this is like cutting edge cryptography, uh, you know, just aggregating signatures and not having to show every single one or uh, it, it's, it, it's so much better than what we have in ECDSA. Um, you know, uh, this is this is why everyone wanted to move to Schnorr is the is is the savings that you get out of it, and you don't you don't need to uh, compromise security uh, with much much larger fees. Um, you you can more or less have the same fees and still get the same level uh, and increase security at the same time. Do you th what do you think about that? What do you think about multi sig tone? Uh well. Uh, this is great. Uh, I just want to comment that 
you know, this is why it it it, it so frustrates me. Where every time I, I only talk how Bitcoin is gonna be the one survivor, everyone always says, "Well, that's because he has all of his money in Bitcoin, and that's where he makes the money, and that's why he thinks everything else is garbage and a scam." No, everything else is is garbage because there is no innovation happening anywhere else. This is where the innovation happens. I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist because that's where all my money is. My money is in Bitcoin because everything else is pure garbage. It's a penny stock. It's a pump and dump. It's a Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme. Why would I have my money anywhere else other than where the innovation is actually taking place? And uh, sooner or later, the world will agree with me on this. And all of those other altcoins will go to zero so fast, nobody will have a chance to get out because of things like this. Yeah, and for one example of an outcome going to zero, we had a BitConnect this week. I think Tony already talked about it, but uh, yeah. Um, so let that be a warning. Jimmy, did, do you have something to add to this? Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't say nobody has innovation other than Bitcoin, but I will say that most of the innovation that the other uh, coins have, quote unquote innovation, is actually just copy of Bitcoin stuff you know they'll backport things and things like that no uh, that's, that's not innovation jimmy i mean well, no, like, i mean uh, i i think monero actually innovated. Like, oh, monero, fine there's, there's like there's i think like zcash actually right there, there's always like one well i mean the, these are the three all coins that i tell people are interesting are zcash monero and decred they actually do something different and they they actually uh, have yeah, innovation but, yeah, but that, that, uh, that, no, but, but that said i i think more innovation is happening in bitcoin than all three I'll combined Okay, see, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you Monero, but I'm not going to give you Zcash because Zcash is just a scam to get 20% of the mining reward. To uh, you don't to think ZK south, Snarks right? is an innovation? Uh, it might be an innovation, but it's a scammy way of uh, releasing them in order to just you know collect. Yeah, I mean, I mean that, so money. their emission schedule might be bad, but the ZK Snarks right. is actually interesting, and and right. and I I, I uh, you know I I think it would be disingenuous of me to say that there's no innovation there. No, no, I mean, that's fine. You can say mm -hmm. there's innovation, but mm -hmm. I will always speak against that project because mm -hmm. of the way it's launched. Like, it's mm -hmm. not launched as a science project. Mm -hmm. It's launched as a private for-profit company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know? that's a fair criticism. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll say, like, if there's a Mimblewimble coin, I think that would also be pretty innovative. Um, but, yeah, other, other than that, uh, I think most right. of them are just straight-up copies or tweaks and not really very interesting or innovative. All right. Um, so uh, let's move on to our final story before we get to the price. And uh, Actually, uh, there is some innovation there. Ledger uh, is uh, developing a decentralized exchange. Well, so, it's 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 not Ledger, but it, if you scroll down, it'll it'll tell you uh, what I, I think it's like the zero X people or it's a uh, radar relay. But they they actually managed to make this work. But yeah, Tone, why don't you so talk Ledger, about it? So it looks like Ledger is tapping into a decentralized exchange that is letting people, uh, that is letting you sign transactions just between two ledgers without going through a middleman, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that seems pretty cool, uh, but I'm still not sure what you would use for price discovery, right? So mm -hmm. it's... Uh, I, I think um, you, you have a central order book, but... Um, because it's a decentralized exchange, you more or less have, uh, you know, uh, you you don't have custody issues with hard forks and things like that. So, um, but but where is the but where does the fiat go? Right, like like an exchange is usually yeah, so dollars. You, for... you, you you need some financial engineering, some sort of like um, a dollar proxy that's used with like some contract for difference or something like that. And I don't I, I don't pretend to understand how all that works. But some some sort of way to proxy the dollar onto something like that in order to make it work. Right. So this is more like the futures contract that Bitmax does, where mm -hmm. you are in control of your own private key until you choose to make a trade, and then uh, that gets released in some form of a smart contract uh, to transfer the difference in the Bitcoin based on uh, an underlying uh, price of uh, of an index that's taking place somewhere else. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so that's pretty cool. At least you're signing with a hardware wallet so you know exactly where the coins are. Uh, my problem is that this sounds like there will be another ICO. So that means this <laughs> entire project is totally centralized. Um, that means this entire project is totally bullshit. And um, I would never participate in it. It's just, again, another way of making money for something. Because once this ICO, once the, um, once the creator of this ICO gets popped by the regulators, what happens to that ERC-20 token? It basically disappears. So what happens to, the, to this technology that was all hyped up because of the token? That's also, you know, someone else will need to just take it as an open source, if it's open source and uh, re-release it. But uh, I'm not, uh, again, anytime I see the words ICO, I just like, I stop. Like I get so many emails, uh, I get so many messages on LinkedIn. I don't understand why you people keep messaging me. Uh, like the moment I see ICO, that's it. I, the email gets deleted. I'm not gonna get back to you guys. So don't bother Tone with the ICO uh, spam because he needs to focus on the price. And I think our viewers wanna talk about price well, let's jump on the mempool for a second. I mean, we're still hovering around 12% uh, for SegWit transactions, but I'm liking this. Like, we almost chewed through the gray area a few hours ago. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, still got to pay, you know, over 100 Satoshis per byte to get your transactions in. And uh, mempool is back hovering around um, 14 megabytes of real transactions. Uh, so still a little bit pricey. You know, you got to... I would pay about 120 Satoshis per byte to get that transaction through. Jimmy? Yeah, uh, I think that's about right. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, I mean, I think you can get in at around uh, maybe, it, it might it might chew through a little bit more. It is the weekend and historically the weekend is, um, you know, is when a lot of this stuff gets chewed through. So if you're willing to wait till Monday, I, I'd even try to go like 80, 85, something like that. That, that, might, that might get into... Um, I, I do have to do some transactions, so I, I might I might try it around eighty five. Um, but yeah, it's uh, the mempool is uh, is interesting. I, I I did see one tweet about the mempool that I I want to mention uh, that we didn't pull up, but um, somebody was saying that a lot of times miners will fill up their block uh, with a few high high value transactions, and then fill the rest up. With very low value, low low transaction fee things, so the high transaction fee um, uh, transactions stay there, uh, and that way, uh, you know, people continue putting in high ones. And this is something that I'm gonna have to study from a game theory perspective, and like, uh, you know, figure out the Nash equilibrium and stuff. But uh, it might actually be rational for them to do that. It, it's kind of um, you know, uh, transaction selection is something that I don't think we know that much about and w what factors go in and uh, from a game theory perspective, whether or not uh, if you if you cooperate, you can sort of force everybody to pay more or something. But it, it, it would be very interesting to study. And and I, and a lot to that when it comes to uh, selection, like I know uh, one miner, I'm not even going to name what country, but that uh, it, it's, it's a miner that, you know, finds a block fairly like you know several times a day they find a the block now so it's a big enough miner and they also run an exchange and because they're a miner and they know the average of how often they find the block they they allow all of their transactions to from the exchange to be uh, almost free because once they find a the block they will always process the transactions from their own exchange so they so the block that they find like 10 or 20% of that block is transactions that they know is, are coming from the, the affiliated exchange, and uh, those are uh, transactions with very tiny fees in the block. Yeah, and uh, Luke Dash Jr. used to do that with his uh, pool Eligius. I, I don't think it has very much hash power anymore, but one of the things that you could do if you were mining for, for that pool, you had the right to put in one transaction per block that they found. Um, so they... So if you were mining with them, you can you can get in free transactions even um, as part of being on that mining mining pool. Okay, Tone. I think our viewers want to know your predictions for the price after this pretty crazy week. Yeah. So uh, I wasn't. I was just so busy with the cruise and so many people there, and um, I spent an entire day uh, doing my trading workshop. I actually live streamed it. 
so hurry up and watch that video because uh, by the end of the weekend, I am going to remove that uh, live stream uh, because that is two hours of my full day seminar where we spend the first half of the day like educating on the basics of trading and getting into slightly more advanced stuff. Then we spend the rest of the day actually, you know, uh, attempting some trades so I can talk about stop losses and proper, uh, and, you know, the proper skill set of what it's like to be a trader because, you know, buying into a sub penny shit coin uh, and waiting for it to pump is not a skill set. And uh, those that will survive the eventual, uh, you know, bubble and collapse of the crypto space, which is coming just like the dot com crash. Uh, those that are real traders, they're the ones that will be able to go on. Uh, and uh, so here's the weekly chart. The weekly chart is bouncing back up. Uh, the weekly chart went officially bearish upon the break of this red line. Once the weekly price fell below, uh, what do I have here? Just under $13,000 a coin. Uh, it, the weekly chart went bearish and it will remain bearish until we probably get back to the fourteen, uh, $15,000 range. Uh, so the weekly chart is staying bearish. Here's the daily chart. Uh, the daily chart was once again, a little bit tricky. Once we broke under the triangle, again, traditional trading, uh, gave you a shorting opportunity. That shorting opportunity accelerated the moment we went to a lower low. I believe the last time I talked about this, I tried to explain to people how uh, I, I do use this uh, numerical system. We refer to it as the random number generator, but it's not really random. And it's based on momentum. And momentum tends to end after nine candles of downside or upside. Now, Bitcoin is way more, uh, you know, biased to the upside. But if you look at this move down, uh, you have this one candle that's screwing up your account. But Bitcoin is just very, very difficult because it's a 24-hour market. Uh, the reason this is a green one is because it's comparing the closing price of this candle to one, two, three, four candles earlier. So it's comparing this candle to this four candle that closed fairly low. But the following candle actually already bounced and closed high. If only the end of day was at a different time period, this could have been easily a red eight, creating a red nine here. So when I step back and look at it, this was a nine candle momentum to the downside. And um, that's why on my last video, I know I haven't done a video in a couple of days, but that's why when this uh, giant uh, doji, dragonfly doji reversal candle was happening, I said, hey, you guys really got to be careful. I know that, that there's no nine here, but if you just step back and remove these numbers, uh, I mean, if you do one of these, um, like if you remove these numbers, I mean, this is how I put this indicator on in the first place. This is clearly like a nine momentum down to me. And um, so it's, it's okay to have a little bit of a bounce, especially after this much of a reversal candle. Uh, but the shorter term time frames uh, were giving you uh, much cleaner signals uh, like this one here. The four hour, it gave you a nine and we reversed on the following candle. Uh, there was another green arrow here. So we're starting to pick up a little bit of a bullish momentum. However, um, all of this is a bit of a bounce that could be short lived. So what I would do is I would take, draw a couple of resistance lines. There are very, very obvious. So the first one on the four hour chart is right here. Um, this is a very clear uh, breakdown line. We had uh, it supported here, here, and here it eventually broke down. And there is a secondary one in this area, uh, though it's obviously not as uh, strong as the first one. So I would be real careful here. The good news is that we're starting to form one of these cups and handles. Um, I still think there is a little downside momentum left. I think a lot of air has been popped out of this balloon 
on Bitcoin and along with a lot of the other altcoins. Uh, so I am not ultra bullish yet. Uh, my daily chart uh, is just on a short term bounce. And let's see what happens if we're even able to make it back to these resistance points of 12,500, 13,000. Um, I remain thinking that the perfect buy point is still in the $7,500 range. Uh, right now, if I had to place a bet, uh, I would say that 7,500 is more likely to hit than 20,000 over the next month or two, uh, but I'm not worried at all uh, all that means for me is that my service is becoming cheaper uh, in terms of fiat, and I would love to go all in and load up in this $7,500 vicinity. Um, $7,500 vicinity is where I was initially looking for the 2017 high. I was looking for a bigger pullback and a little bit of a struggle. Uh, I contribute this move from $7,500 all the way to $20,000 is all of the unnecessary hype of Wall Street getting in. Now that Wall Street is in and people are realizing that Wall Street has done nothing um, as far as you know, advancing Bitcoin anywhere, even though the futures are now with us, it's not a conspiracy theory that the futures are driving the price down. I think that's absolutely ridiculous. I think that um, it was just hype of unqualified traders uh, driving it up the way things always do. And now we're coming into reality. Uh, my target for now remains 7,500. Uh, but the moment things start to look bullish, I'll let you guys know. Uh, for short-term traders, uh, trading off of this nine right here just the other day uh, would have been a nice bounce trade. And there's nothing really going on here. If we can break above this line in, uh, in the $12,100 range, uh, then there could be a pop to another level of resistance. Uh, the one hour chart uh, is also uh, around the time of the four hour nine, there was a one hour nine. And uh, I'm not even sure if I had time to tweet this out or anything. So this was the short term trade. Uh, I mean, and now you just wait. The short term trade was here off of this reversal candle, off of the one hour nine, the four hour nine. Uh, it told you to take your profit around uh, 11,800, uh, which is about where we are still today. So uh, the trade was from here, from, uh, from 11 a.m. New York time on 117, up until the evening of 117. Ever since then, I see absolutely nothing. If we can break out above 12,000, I would see that as a bullish trade to so about 12, 50, 13,000. Um, and after that, we just reevaluate. Okay, um, I'll leave it there. I know I have a Ripple tab only because it's just been there on my charts. I don't really want to show it, but um, I happened to glance at it this morning. <clears throat> and from the purposes of using the indicator as a trade, uh, it was just a perfect buying opportunity based on the indicator, even though Ripple is a scam coin uh, right here off of the arrow of the 13. And you know exactly where to take your profit right off the arrow on the nine. So this was actually quite a profitable trade from 0001 uh, up to what do we got here? 00014. So, you know, that's 40%. Uh, so this is why I prefer this random number generator as the recommended trade. However, uh, on Ripple, uh, boom, a red two has started trading below a red one. So this is now a short play. Uh, and Bitcoin is just, uh, Bitcoin is not a long play according to the hourly chart. Uh, you would have entered uh, as the three started trading above the two. But all this choppiness, you don't trade this. Bitcoin has been in a no trade zone for days now. Just wait for the breakout above 12,000 for your bullish trade and a breakdown below 11,000 for your a bearish trade. Uh, I'll leave it there. So sometimes trading can be as simple as two lines in the sand. Thank you very much, Tone Vase, and uh, you did a great job keeping everybody up to date, even on the cruise. 
We're going to try to get back to a little bit more regular schedule now. Tone is uh, fixed in his nice room in Asia. Uh, yeah, and, I'm, uh, I'm in Singapore. I'm, a, I'm in Singapore a couple of more days and then I'm flying somewhere. I really got to be careful about, you know, telegraphing where I'm flying to. Uh, maybe I should start saying as I'm leaving the country, not as I'm coming into the country. Uh, more and more people continue to warn me uh, about being a high profile target. But I'm broke, guys. Um, uh, the, the, this hotel room looks nice. I didn't pay for it. I can't afford this thing. I was a, I was in this hotel room yesterday all day. Uh, I was being interviewed for a Bitcoin documentary. Uh, so it was uh, the film, the documentary's film crew that uh, hooked me up with this, and then they had to go to their respective country. Very nice. That's nice. Okay, well, thank you, everybody, for watching. We'll be back with more info on how we schedule the show. And have a good weekend, Jimmy. Yeah, I'm, I'm really tired, and I have way, way too much work to do. But uh, So, yeah, this song is done, man. This song is done. Bye, guys. All right, guys, I'll let you.